name is Michael Dannenberg. I'm the director of our education policy program. Uh, we are here at the New America Foundation are starting a new initiative called the Federal Education Budget Project. Uh, the budget project aims to serve as a authoritative source of nonpartisan, uh, easily accessible, hopefully, information on education finance matters from the size, distribution, efficiency, effectiveness of federal education funding across the board. For those of you who are familiar with the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, what they do on a very uh, large macro level uh, and focused on low-income programs, we are hope to do for education specifically with, that, with their rigor but without their uh, uh, avowedly liberal bent. We uh, aim uh, very hard to be nonpartisan. Uh, this is sort of a pre-launch event for the Federal Education Budget Project. We'll be having a more formal launch later in the fall uh, with all sorts of resources available for you for every school district and state in the country, as you may note from your one-pagers. I'm going to turn our program over to Jason Delisle, who's our research director here at the New America Foundation, fresh from the Senate Budget Committee's uh, Republican staff, and he'll introduce our speakers and moderate today's event. Thank you for coming. All right. Uh, thank you, Michael. I'm um, going to first introduce uh, all of our, our speakers, uh, and then they'll, um, they'll speak, and then we'll open it up um, for some questions after that. Uh, so first, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Peter Cohen, who uh, many of you have probably read some of his, uh, his articles. Um, he, uh, he's the budget and appropriations reporter for Congress Daily. Uh, and has covered Capitol Hill for uh, nearly seven years, of, you know, with the uh, with Congress Daily and also with uh, Congressional Quarterly. Uh, and he's been with Congress Daily since 2003 uh, and covered uh, a number of areas such as transportation, uh, telecommunications, uh, as well as budget and, and appropriations. Uh, he is a graduate of Colgate University. Uh, Peter is going to tell us a little bit about. Um, what the sort of current lay of the land is with the appropriations fight uh, right now, um, what sort of the source of the, uh, the delay is in, in finishing all the bills at the start of the fiscal year, which was Monday, I believe, uh, and when uh, we're going to wrap up and um, how that might all, all finish up. Uh, and then uh, we're going to hear from um, my colleague here at New America Foundation, uh, Heather Riemann, uh, who is policy analyst um, in the education shop, and she focuses on issues of educational quality, uh, especially pertaining to education budget and finance issues at the federal level, um, both K through 12 and higher education. Um, before uh, working here at New America Foundation, she uh, worked on the Senate Help, uh, Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee as uh, as a staffer there, and uh, she has also worked as a program policy analyst at the budget office of the Department of Education. She has a master's degree from Harvard University. So she's going to tell us uh, a little bit about some of the findings from her, her work, um, from the issue brief that you should all have a copy of uh, that New America is putting out today, about some of the trends in education spending, um, some of the, the ways that education spending fits into the larger budget. Uh, and, and what's been happening um, with that and also what some of the um, sort of the scenarios might be uh, for education spending in the appropriations uh, wrap up over the next maybe weeks or months even. Uh, and then uh, we'll hear from uh, Barbara Chow who's the policy director on the majority staff of the House Budget Committee. Uh, she has a long bio. Um, you should have a copy of it so you can you can get that information but I'll just highlight a few points uh, before being on the on the House Budget Committee she uh, worked at the National Geographic Society uh, from 1993 to 1997 she was special assistant to the president for legislative affairs at the White House uh, she was also worked at OMB as associate director for education income maintenance labor um, from 1997 to 2001 she has a master's degree from UC Berkeley and an undergraduate degree from Pomona College so hopefully she can tell us some of the lessons that she's learned um, in the budget negotiations and particularly how, uh, how they affect education. So I'll leave it to Peter. Uh, good morning. I, uh, I, I guess right now uh, the Senate is working on its... Uh, oh, sorry. Do we oh, sorry. speak at the podium? 
Oh, is there you want? Yeah, I'll yeah, find you. This is your most comfortable there. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. That was how it's going. You know, they've all read your pieces. Now they want to see what you look like. Oh. <laughs> Hopefully, it doesn't. Uh, um, right now, uh, the Senate is in the middle of its um, right in the middle of its appropriations process, and the Senate typically uh, takes quite a bit longer than, than the House. Uh, the education budget is is going to be towards the uh, is the latter half of uh, towards the latter half of what the Senate is going to consider, um, and that's going to come up after Columbus Day. The Senate is going to take a one week break. Uh, next week, and um, that bill should come up after the recess, and it's going to take a few days on the floor. It's got uh, uh, increases, as you can all see in, in this uh, wonderful analysis by uh, uh, Heather Riemann. Um, uh, the problem is that bill is going to go down to the White House, and President Bush is going to veto it. We all know this. Everyone on Capitol Hill knows it. Um, the question is, what happens after that? And uh, it's really anybody's guess at this point because uh, the two parties have shown uh, Democrats have expressed a willingness to negotiate on the overall spending levels of which education is a significant uh, aspect of that. Um, but the president has shown absolutely will zero willingness to negotiate, uh, and anybody will tell you that. Um, and the problem for the Democrats is that pres the president does have the leverage on this front because. Um, as is in this analysis, the uh, House Republican leadership has rounded up the necessary signatures on a letter saying that they'll sustain uh, any veto of uh, an appropriations bill that goes to the president. So um, President Bush has simply decided to put his foot down and say, there's no reason for me to negotiate because I have the votes. Um, so the question for the Democrats is, how do they get around that? How do they, do they capitulate? Uh, what, what is the next step? And that is a subject of intense debate right now on Capitol Hill. Um, for the time being, the Democrats feel that uh, they want to have this fight with President Bush. They've, they've been trying to get this bill, the Labor HHS Education Appropriations Bill, up on the floor of the Senate for some time now. Um, but they've had a lot of other priorities over there. Um, the Congress has focused quite a bit on Iraq, uh, almost exclusively, some would say, this whole year on, on the Iraq War. And uh, that's really crowded out. Uh, a lot of other things. Now the Democrats are having this battle over the S-CHIP program, the State Children's Health Insurance Program, which they've made sort of the first uh, round in, in the domestic policy fight with the White House. Now that is going to be uh, ongoing for some time, but uh, again, that bill is also in a holding pattern because the President has vetoed it and uh, he has the votes to sustain that veto. So while that is, while the Democrats go back to the drawing board on that one, uh, they're going to turn to now, they're trying to turn to the uh, domestic budget, including the education department. Um, and uh, how that ends up, again, is uh, clearly the subject of some discussion. But in the meantime, they're going to have that fight. They're going to send it down to the White House uh, for the president's veto. He's going to send it back. And, uh, and the Democrats think they're going to uh, win the battle of public opinion on that one because um, it is – some would say it is a, is a hefty increase uh, over the president's budget and over the current year, um, but you have to look at it in the total context of the budget. The president is requesting something like a two or three billion dollar cut to the department uh, below the current year, and you factor in inflation, and uh, that cut gets significantly larger. So uh, the debate for the Democrats is how do they characterize what they're trying to do? Uh, as, as something that's modest, very modest, um, compared with the overall budget of some $3 trillion. And at the same time, the President has requested nearly $200 billion for the war in Iraq. So this is what the Democrats think they can do by sending the education budget to him on its own, combined with uh, HHS and labor, and, um, and really just demonstrate that those programs on their own are worthwhile programs both parties can support, modest increases when you look at the t overall federal, uh, federal budget and projected spending on Iraq that is really not that much. Um, so that's kind of where they are right now. Uh, whether they're successful in that is, uh, in, in public opinion, there have been polls out saying that maybe that's a winner for the Democrats. Um, but again, they don't have the votes right now. So um, your guess is as good as mine. With that, I'll 
wrap up. Thanks, Peter. That was interesting. It's good to see you all here today. Um, you should have a copy of our issue brief by now, and I'm not going to go over it in too much detail. I'm afraid I might bore you all. <laughs> but um, I am going to just highlight some things, and I'm going to highlight four main areas. First, that fiscal year 2008 looks like it could be a really significant year for education funding. And we'll go into that more about why that is, and it's sort of an interesting take we have combining mandatory and discretionary funding. The second point that I'll make is just that education is probably going to get caught up in the larger budget fight, as we just heard. Um, but that, you know, there's going to be people who argue federal spending is growing too fast, and they may target education spending as one of the causes. But really, in our analysis, we find that re education spending is relatively minor in comparison with the overall budget and has remained relatively constant over the last couple of years. Um, the third thing we'll look at is sort of just discretionary spending, what's happening with dis discretionary and mandatory spending. Discretionary spending is actually increasing at a faster rate than mandatory spending. So we wanted to know why, what's causing that. And when we took a closer look at that, I mean, not, not too surprisingly, it's defense and war supplemental appropriations, not really um, domestic spending such as education. Um, finally, I'll just wrap it up by looking at a few different scenarios that could play out. And things are happening so rapidly that some of these scenarios are already changing, but uh, we'll just give you some, some more ideas of what we think could possibly happen. Um, so let me go into a little more depth. Fiscal year 2008 is poised to be a significant year for education funding. As many of you know, education funding contains mandatory and discretionary spending. Taking the two together, fiscal year 2008 could be the most significant change this decade. Congress may increase funding for students, teachers, and schools by seven to eight billion in two different stages. So the first stage involves mandatory spending and it's already happened. Um, Congress increased student financial aid by about three billion in mandatory spending over the last year and is increasing it 20 billion over the next five years. Um, this increase was offset by cuts in federal subsidies to student loan providers. And it basically goes to student loans and Pell Grants. Um, so the second step, which is sort of separate from the first step, is what's happening with the appropriations process. Um, as part of the appropriations process, it looks like Congress will probably increase funding for the Department of Education by four to five billion over the fiscal year 2007 level. The House has an increase of about five billion. The Senate has an increase of about a little less than three billion. So we think it might end up somewhere around four billion. And considering how education has been relatively level funded over the last couple of years, that's a really major increase. In fact, it actually could be the second largest increase for education since the passage of No Child Left Behind in 2001. Um, so, and the main increases go towards funding for Title I, IDEA, and Pell Grants. However, as I mentioned earlier when I was speaking, um, this is, the whole increase is not guaranteed and it's likely to get caught up in the larger funding fight. Um, President Bush is threatening to veto spending that in the aggregate exceeds $932 billion. Congress put forward a budget resolution that was about $23 billion more than the President's request, so hence the showdown we're looking at now. Um, the Labor H bill sort of ends up being almost about half of what the um, fight is over. Um, in our brief, we say it's about $11 billion above the President's request. We actually forgot to include about a $2 billion in advance appropriations. So it's, it's corrected in our online version, but that sort of bumps it up to 13, which is really about half of what the whole fight is over. Um, so just to give you a little background on Labor H, it's the biggest of the domestic discretionary bills. Um, it's often one of the most controversial, and because of that, it's usually sort of left towards the end, and Congress has a hard time passing it. Some, some years they don't even. Um, but this year, it, again, will be really controversial. It looks like for political reasons, as we heard from Peter, they, they're probably going to bring it up sooner rather than later, which should be interesting. We'll see how that plays out. Um, but uh, yes, the, so the president has already threatened to veto the House bill, calling it an irresponsible and excessive level of spending. And as the funding level for Labor H is debated, there will definitely be some Congress members who argue against an increase in education funding because they think that the federal budget is too large and want to rein in spending. However, our analysis shows that the amount spent on education is relatively minor with 
respect to the overall budget, and also has remained fairly steady in recent years. Education is only a small fraction of federal spending. As a share of the total federal budget, education funding has remained re relatively constant at about 2 to 3 percent over the last few years, and as a share of discretionary sp spending has remained also relatively constant at about 5 to 6 percent of discretionary spending. Um, so it's, one could argue against increases for education for a variety of reasons in terms of efficiency, effectiveness, there are a lot of reasons you might want to argue against education spending increases, um, but targeting education spending in order to reduce the rate of growth of the federal budget seems misguided and unlikely to have a significant impact on the total budget. It is true, of course, though, that discretionary spending is increasing. Um, so if education spending has been relatively constant, what is driving up spending, we want to take a closer look. So we examine the spending from 2001 to 2006, and basically looking at that, increases in discretionary spending have been largely driven by defense spending and supplemental war appropriations spending, not surprisingly. Um, discretionary spending in 2006 was about 50 percent higher than it was in 2001, and it's actually increasing at a faster rate than mandatory spending. Um, Spending on defense and the war accounts for about 69 percent of the overall increase, while domestic expenditures account for only about 31 percent of the increase. So just kind of wanted to give you some sort of background facts and information, um, and then let's take a look at how this could play out. We, there's many different scenarios. We sort of discussed three in the brief, um, and I'll just briefly mention those. The first is that, um, I mean, the There'll be probably a lot of showmanship. Individual bills will, will go forward. They'll probably get vetoed. And in the end, Congress will probably pass some sort of omnibus bill. Um, for Republicans facing tough re-election battles, voting against increases for popular domestic programs like education could be problematic. And eventually, some members of Congress may break with the president, um, especially if the issues are sort of narrowed to education or health care or other popular programs and um, they could end up sending the president a bill that's higher than the level he wants and then, you know, could be a federal, could be a um, government shutdown. That seems unlikely. Probably they would pass a continuing resolution that would just keep funding constant until they negotiated some level. But one interesting thing to note is that of the 147 Republicans who signed this letter saying they would support the president's veto, a number of those members already voted for the Labor H bill which was above the president's level. So it's kind of like, in aggregate, yeah, they're not so sure about funding increases, but when it comes to specific programs like education, they may, you know, have second thoughts about that, and some of them have already voted for the labor H bill. Um, so that's one thing that could happen. The second scenario that I'll discuss is just um, something that's happened last year, and it's probably likely to happen again this year, which is Congress shifts some of the funding um, to the Supplemental War Appropriations Bill. So Congress sort of keeps the level of the um, domestic discretionary bills up as high as they want it to, and then they cut a program, probably defense makes the most sense, and sort of backfill it and then fund that through the Supplemental Appropriations Bills. Um, so Congress gets what they want in that they get, you know, the level of domestic spending they want under President's cap of how much he wants to spend, and then the money is sort of shifted around to the Supplemental Appropriations Bill and neither Congress nor the President tends to treat the supplemental appropriations bills as if they count towards spending limits. So this sort of budgetary game of backfilling um, was done last year and is, you know, fairly likely to happen again this year. Um, so for the final scenario, this is just kind of an interesting scenario. It's pretty unlikely to happen, but we thought it was worth noting because it directly involves education. So um, there's a possible deal to be made here. Um, there's not that many things the president wants in this budget fight. He wants defense, he wants war, but one thing he does want is he wants No Child Left Behind reauthorized. So potentially there could be some sort of deal where in exchange for the reauthorization of No Child Left Behind um, in you know, only a slightly modified form for a short amount of time, he would agree to an increase in education funding. Um, the timing might not work out on this. Congress still has a ways to go before they finalize the No Child Left Behind reauthorization. But it's an interesting thing to think about and one of the few things sort of the president actually wants that may be used as a bargaining chip in this whole debate. Um, so in conclusion, it remains to be seen how the budget battle will play out and if education funding will sort of withstand the whole budget fight. 
Um, this could be a significant year for education funding if it does not get caught up in the larger debate. On the whole, though, the fight is still over a $23 billion increase, which equals 2% of discretionary fight, uh, funding and 8 tenths of a percent of the total budget. If Congress and the President really want to be serious about the federal budget and reducing it, they need to consider a much broader set of policies and funding proposals. Hello. See, well, the, let's see. I, I'll, I think it's shorter than anybody else. So, let, can you hear me? Um, anyway, the, sort of the challenge of being last in a panel is often that everybody says everything that you're going to say, and you just find yourself crossing. We thought you were best off. able to handle that. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I think everything. I agree with everything that has been said so far. And you know, Peter left things by saying um, that it's anybody's guess, and Heather outlined some different scenarios. And I am speaking uh, entirely from the basis of, of my own personal experience having done this before and not really on behalf of Congress. So I'm just going to go ahead and guess, <laughs> make some guesses, I think. Why not, anyway? Um, and let me, let me talk about them. There are kind of three things that I wanted to, questions that I was going to try to answer that I thought were the questions that we're all, all asking each other right now. And I'm just going to try to answer them. One is, you know, what's the end game? Um, and when will Congress get out of here? That's sort of something that we ask ourselves every single day <laughs> on the Hill right now, and you're asking yourselves. The second is what's going to happen between uh, now and then. And the third is if you're um, representing specific education programs or, or anything else in this area, how do you kind of navigate the next three months or two months? It's a very tumultuous, very uncertain time, and what can you best do to protect and maximize your own chances, I think, of succeeding in your programs? So let me take a stab at answering all of those. And again, you know, I'm, I'm going to do this um, on the basis of sort of 25 years of experience and sort of a natural pessimism that I've developed from having worked in this. And I've seen so many familiar faces. A lot of other folks here have also done the same thing. I think we've all been through these wars together. So they're not. This is not at all what I want to happen. And I really hope that I'm wrong on most of this, but I'm going to go ahead and sort of guess anyway. So when will we get out of here? Um, we will get out of here. Uh, Congress will recess on um, December 20th at 435. That's my <laughs> guess. How's that? And that's not, that, believe me, is not, not what we want. But After I think a it's really late. late night on the 19th, it's a late right? night. It's That's a Thursday. Everybody's got plane tickets by Friday. I do by Saturday. So. That sounded about right. I think somebody said, I'd earlier guessed it would be Monday, but they said if you're in on Monday, you'll be in on Thursday. So that's my guess. <laughs> and what will be the state of appropriations at that moment on at 435 on December 20th? I think I'd guess right now that uh, we'll be in a continuing resolution, that most programs will end up there. There'll be some exceptions here and there, and we can talk about that, but for the most part, that's where I would guess. And, I, you know, there's sort of two scenarios that when you think about it that can kind of unfold over the next few months. One is that stalemate, and a CR is a stalemate, basically, because it just preserves your options, it preserves the programs, it's a fight for another day kind of <laughs> scenario. The other is a grand negotiation, and that's something that I think, um, you know, I was lucky enough to participate in, many of you were, in the Clinton administration, I actually negotiated out the Labor H bills several times um, towards the end there. And I was sort of thinking, why won't that happen? And let me give you a couple of reasons, again, just based upon my, my own experience. One is I was sort of, this was a trip down memory lane to think about this, but when we were at this point in our administration, six years, seven, seven years in, we had, you know, sort of a couple of things. One is this great sense of urgency. You know, there was one more year. We knew we had a million things to do. As you know, President Clinton saw education as a very key priority. He had a lot of, a lot of sort of specific programs that he wanted to get done. He needed money for them. He needed authorizations. We'd had sort of, um, sort of at this point again, in our administration, we were four years into this. We'd gone through two government shutdowns. We'd negotiated a big bipartisan budget deal by 90, in 97. The president was impeached in 1998. And so, again, kind of coming into it, you know, at the same time in our administration, 
we'd had a lot of experience doing this. And when we walked into the room with uh, Mr. Goodling, you know, negotiating on the other side, we'd all sort of knew our roles. Everybody had, had met each other. They trusted each other at some level. They knew what they were going to, people knew what the other side was going to ask for. And I think those are the ingredients in some ways to get to yes, because you've had a lot of experience getting there. And also because you've kind of had the big blow up fights beforehand and you got those out of the way. So that's the, unfortunately not the experience right now. You know, this administration really has not needed to negotiate like this before. This is going to be something quite new to them. And, you know, just listening to sort of some of the speeches, President Bush spoke yesterday about this, and it sounded a little bit like he was sort of setting up the same kind of fight that he's had on everything else. It's not a, it's a question of values and beliefs, not, you know, he's not going to be influenced by the polls and so forth. And so I guess that's the sort of one of the main reasons. The second is, if you sort of think about, again, the positions of the parties, you know, when, you know, to <laughs> repeat what I just said, when we came into those negotiations and those appropriation fights, we had a long list of things that we wanted to get done when we were in the White House. So we wanted class size reduction. Do you remember these <laughs> days? We wanted school construction. Ed remembers all of these things. We wanted increases in Title I. So we had a, we had a list. And my sense is, and I'm not you know, that involved with it right now, that this administration does not have a particularly long list. Or if they do, it's not, um, they're not trying to get a lot of new things going. For the most part, I think they're trying to kind of slow things down or stop things. And so the positions are very reversed, I think, from those that enabled us, I think, to get to this bigger number. And I think, it's, you know, the last is just look at the numbers themselves. If you end up with a CR for most programs except for defense, you're below the president's budget, I think a couple billion below. So if your goal is really just to hold spending constant, in some ways, that is the outcome that you might want to seek. So that's kind of depressing to me, <laughs> and depressing given that I think Heather, you know, um, sort of described this as being sort of the best opportunity in many, many years to get a significant increase in education. But um, for those, for the reasons that I just described, I think this is going to be a, a challenge. So what's going to happen between now and then? I think um, Peter described this pretty well. I think there'll be a, you know, the Senate is working away on its bills. It's hard to get things through the Senate um, because, the, you know, obviously the, the votes are, are not there for a lot of these things. It takes 60 votes to get anything done. So it's more of a challenge. Um, but I think they'll work it out. We'll send bills, Congress will send bills to the President. And there's sort of a Noah's Ark theory that you're all hearing that they'll go, you know, two by two. The, kind of the bad bill and the good bill, or the bill that's going to be vetoed, and the bill that will not perhaps um, packaging together the uh, VA Milcon bill, which the President indicated he'd sign, and Labor H, which is a bill that he said he'd veto. So, you know, that's one theory of how they'll sort of end up in the President's desk. Um, I think whatever, you know, Democrats are sort of doing everything they can at, at this moment to try to avoid the scenario that I just described, but, and I think that's one way kind of to get more leverage into the process. But again, I, it's my own sort of sense that the President will veto these anyway, so, you know, that this argument over spending is an argument that he wants to have. And so, I, you know, I'm worried anyway that we'll have several vetoes and we'll still end up in this kind of stalemate that we talked about before. So, you know, given all that, what, what can one do? What can one do if you care about research programs or Title I or the many things that you in this room care about? Well, I mean, the, the, the truth of it is you can do a few things. You can try to make the best policy arguments you possibly can. And we were talking about this earlier. I think that you can have a set forth a a vision for what the world would be like if your programs are fully funded. You know, I think one of the most successful things that the Clinton administration was actually able to do is it had a fairly clear sense of, of um, for example, the class size reduction program of what, um, you know, that we would hire teachers, that that would reduce class size. And for most parents, they understood in instinctively that that would help their kids in, in school. So it was sort of a a, a, a pretty concrete sense in your own head about what the stakes are in this fight ahead. And I think that's really the most important thing that you can do.
But that said, if, you know, all of this, you know, you, you try this and this does not work, there's, there's always another day. That's a wonderful thing about the budget. It comes out every year. It will be a supplemental um, pretty soon. You know, as soon as, this, as soon as they go out in December and by January, February, they'll be uh, working on the next. Unfortunately, those poor folks in the appropriations process. You know, in, in not, too di the not too distant future, whichever party wins, there will be a new president. So that's a huge opportunity. So I guess my best advice is just to have, you know, be ready for those moments that they, I think the uh, next few months are going to be pretty tough. And maybe the next year and a half is going to be pretty tough. But the moment will come again, I have no doubt about it, especially in education, I think, for some very, very sizable increased funding and new initiatives because I think that sort of moment is needed and it's been uh, dormant for, for too long. So just be ready to walk into it, I guess, when it comes cause, because I think it will. So that's, uh, that's my guesses. Um, so we'll, we'll open it up for questions, but um, being the moderator, I always get to reserve the right to the first question. So I have one for, um, for, for probably more for, for Barbara and Heather on um, some higher education spending. Um, there's this new uh, recently signed into law reconciliation bill that made a number of changes um, to student loan subsidies uh, and for the first time we now have mandatory spending um, for Pell Grants as a supplement. Um, and we're talking about an appropriations fight where the the sort of central bill in, in a lot of this is the, the labor HHS bill, which includes a significant increase for the Pell Grants uh, in the House. Um, the Senate is flat funded. Uh, when those bills were passed, there was not mandatory money available for Pell Grants. Um, so do either of you see, um, do you think it's likely that the appropriators for the labor HHS bill, who are under tremendous pressure, maybe, to uh, reduce the level of the bill or find new money uh, to cut Pell Grant funding from what they were originally going to do and make up the difference for, with the mandatory money that is now sitting there, uh, sort of undermining the whole point of the reconciliation bill that has a new mandatory uh, Pell Grant supplement. Uh, is this on? Okay. Um, my, my guess would be that in the short term, they probably won't cut Pell Grants. Um, they've already sort of established a, a level for the year, and it'll look like they're reducing it. But I do think long term, there could be a significant amount of pressure, if maybe not necessarily to cut it, but sort of to level fund it, because they know that the mandatory piece of it is going to come and bump it up. So I guess that's... that's yeah. The only thing I add to that is my understanding is that the reconciliation bill, and you guys would know this better than I do, assumed a certain level and that uh, sort of, it, that the appropriations committee would provide a certain level for Pell Grants and that the mandatory level would be above that. So in any event, I think the appropriations committee kind of needs to fill the trough up to that level and the mandatory level can go above that, um, which would, I don't know where the numbers stack out, but to the extent that, um, you know, that they would require an increase, I think they'll do whatever they need to do to get to 4700 to a $4,700 uh, Pell Grant award amount, so. Okay. Um, so, you have questions? Anybody? You there, ma'am? Thank you. I'd like to ask a hypothetical. I may think it's less hypothetical than others. Let's say over the next 14 days, another 15 House Republicans read the polls, hear from their congressional district, read their mail, hear from the kids' advocates in their district, look at the state budget without us funding, and vote to overrule. Let's say S chip veto is overridden by both the House and the Senate. How does that change everything you all are talking about? I think would have a profound impact on everything else if there is that success. And I'm just wondering if that would alleviate some of your pessimism. What, what happens then, do you think, on the appropriations process? Does it make a difference? No, Peter, do you? Uh, I, I, I don't think that's likely to happen um, because I think they're all pretty well locked in now. They've all secured commitments, the, the WIP teams are, are working overtime, they're having meetings on this every single day. Um, I, I, I don't see that happening, but you're, you're absolutely correct if it does happen uh, by some, as far as the Democrats are concerned, miracle, uh, it would have a profound impact. I think it would change the entire uh, landscape. I, I think you're, you'd see a lot more 
uh, optimism that, say, Labor HHS education bill could get through with a significant increase. Absolutely. But I just, I just don't see that happening. That's, that's my guess, since we're all guessing today. <laughs> Anybody else? Okay. Do we have a, somebody else want to ask a question? Yeah. Okay. Well, kind of piggybacking uh, on that, um, in the President's remarks, he has said that now that he is willing to negotiate on s um, Again, under that scenario, do you see any, since he's willing to negotiate on s and he hasn't been willing to negotiate on really anything else that we does that mean that you know, we've broken a, a log jam there? And perhaps um, he is also will be willing to negotiate on the, on the appropriations numbers. I mean, I, I'll, I'll just take a, a guess at that. I, I think that's what you, you know, again, this is sounds will sound really, really cynical, but I think that's what you say when you veto a bill. You say, I am willing and I want to negotiate this out because it's, you know, sounds bad to say anything other than that. And that, I hope I'm not, I just, I hope I'm wrong about everything I say today because that's really <laughs> not, a good, not a good view of the world. But, but I'm, I, I'm worried about that anyway. And, and I know that, you know, one of the things that um, there was a big article uh, today about the desire to link the health insurance proposal, I think, that the president had to the CHIP bill. And that that's, again, a it's very late to start this process for, for those kinds of things. That's my – just the calendar is going to kind of, I think, be the biggest enemy, I think, for, for anything because it takes – a long time to put these things together for people to take positions, for them to to, to just work out some, some of the details of this. And so, um, I guess that's my I don't know. You guys have a different view? Uh, no, I absolutely agree. It's far too late in the game to start working on a massive uh, sort of putting an entirely new piece on on the on the board. It's uh, I mean, people are, are really are, they're trying to lessen the amount of pieces on the board at this point. Uh, Barbara talked about how uh, you know now the, the president's supplemental request looks like it's, it's going to wait until next year uh, when everybody thought that was going to come up uh, sometime this fall or, or winter. Um, people do eventually want to get out of town at this point, um, but they're not quite there yet. But uh, putting a major new initiative like that is very unlikely, I, I believe. You have another question? Go ahead. How likely do you think the majority will be to act as um, Reducing the lesser known, less easily understood programs in the labor age bill um, in order to make gains in others. Yeah, again, that that I think that the challenge is that assumes that you're sitting across the table in a big room in S-128 or wherever it might be making trade-offs, you know, where you'll cut this and you'll increase that and so forth, which is very much the style of negotiation that I think a lot of us are familiar with and have been in, involved with. But if, you know, so you have to sort of get to that point. Um, and if we get to that point, then I think you can, you, there'll, there'll, there'll have to be some kind of give and take that that's the way these things work. But I guess, um, I don't really see us getting to that point in the, or we, <laughs> the Congress and the President getting to that point uh, right now for the, for the reasons that I just described. I mean, I, I can see big, you know, some, I think if even if there's a continuing resolution, it doesn't mean that every program is frozen at its 2006 level. It means there certainly could be exceptions and there, there are areas that there's a lot of agreement on. For example, in veterans health care, that is something that I think everybody wants to increase. So it's not, it's not, it doesn't mean that everything's frozen in time, there will be cha some changes to that. The question is, you know, what fits into that category and what ends up staying uh, level. I would just sort of throw out that I think this, the sort of smaller programs will end up staying level and, the, you know, only the very big moving pieces will, um, will have some significant changes. But that was the case for education under the 2007 CR. Um, where earlier this year um, when the CR was passed, it, it level funded everything, but there was a um, there was a, an increase for major education programs like the Pell Grant and um, Title I spending for uh, No Child Left Behind. So, and that's something that was done just just very recently. And, and so, CR, yeah, you're right. It doesn't necessarily mean that programs like education would be funded at the same level. Sure, go ahead. <coughs> 
I don't want to leap ahead too far, but looking ahead to a presidential election here, um, what historically has happened during a presidential election year when you reach the budget or appropriations impasse, like it looks like we're approaching for FYO 8, um, do you have any thoughts about what might happen next year uh, as people are kind of desperately trying to find ways to win elections? Well, I, again, my only experience was my only experience, and in our last year, you know, again, at the <coughs> administration, there were a set, of, a set of things that, you know, he really saw at, at that moment the clock ticking very, very fast, and so there were a lot of things that he wanted to get done, and the appropriations process was the way in which they were going to get done. So it was another burst of energy <laughs> in that last moment there. I don't, again, I just don't see that for for. For, for these guys for next year because it's you know that next year's going to be a very disrupted year the, the, there's a lot of um, they'll need to go out a lot it's obviously an open um, you know a presidential race which has, has not been for a long time so there's I think the circumstances are quite different and, and it might again my sense is that Bush does not have a legacy a set of legacy domestic programs that he's very very anxious to get through and since it takes you know, two to tango, I think you need that. You need both sides wanting something to get to an agreement. But could the Republicans sort of split from the president in a more significant way than now because they're desperately trying to win elections uh, and maybe the White House? And so it could, could become a great opportunity for funding. <clears throat> Is that, do you think that's reasonable to think that way? I, I hope so. I really <laughs> do because I think that's, I, I mean, it, it's sort of, it's the question, I think, the political question is, is it better to have a, a fight over spending, which is sort of appealing to one base, I think, or is it better to have, uh, be, be able to sort of tout increases in children's health and education programs that are very, very popular with, with folks. And, you know, that's a political calculation that people are just going to have to make individually, right? At the moment, I think enough of them are making the calculation that the fight over spending is a good one to have. You know, maybe over time that'll change, or even the next few months that'll change, because the polls are clearly not supporting that right now. I don't think, but you know, but those are national polls and not individuals. So, uh, go ahead. Uh, simple question for Peter: um, if, if 14 days from now we will vote on the bill in the Senate, what will that vote be, and what's the magic number for our override in the Senate? You're referring to the leverage vote. Oh. Um, uh, some question exactly when it's going to come up in the Senate. I think pretty close uh, after uh, the Columbus Day break. Um, what's the, you asked me what the vote's going to be. Yeah, $100. Is that on the vote? <laughs> <laughs> See, but the, problem, the problem with that bill um, in the Senate is it's got stem cell language on it, uh, which some Democrats don't support. All the Democrats, I think, support the funding increases, but the stem cell issue is going to be a little bit of a problem for, for some of them. So that could kind of artificially uh, drop the vote count down a little bit to below a veto-proof majority. But I think that uh, Senator Harkin, who's the chairman of the committee in the Senate, uh, has indicated he's willing to negotiate on that. Uh, that. That could be something if they get rid of that in conference, for example, they could boost their support a little bit. As far as the veto-proof, uh, once that happens, uh, yeah, 66, 67, I think, uh, that is, is more likely. Um, they've been getting 80, 80 plus votes for some. The first big domestic uh, appropriation bill was the transportation housing bill, and they got, I think, uh, 80, 81 votes, perhaps. So um, it, I think it'll be between 60 and 80. I mean, so let's say 70. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we have time for one quick more question. So one more quick one. Anybody? Given, this is for the whole panel, given the new majority's desire to restore fiscal responsibility by reinstating PAYGO and keeping the discretionary caps relatively low, how difficult will it be to obtain future increases in educational funding beyond the next Congress and dealing with the next president? Let's start. Uh, so with PAYGO, you mean, is, it gonna, is that going to make it harder to get? Yes. Okay. Uh, I, Pago makes it harder to do anything. I think Barbara will be the first to tell you that. Um, 
but they, they did it with the uh, education reconciliation bill this year. Um, you know, that, that I think the Democrats would tout as a success for their PAYGO initiative, although there are some who will argue that that was an, an abuse of the reconciliation process, which is supposed to be primarily for major deficit reduction. Uh, instead, they're spending a lot of money. Um, so the, they, they can do it. Uh, I, I think the chances increase for, on the discretionary side, which is not subject to PAYGO, the chances increase beginning next year for big budgeting increases. Uh, I, you're already starting to hear people on Capitol Hill saying, you know, next year, election year, um, Bush is going to have far less support among his own um, people in the House and Senate. Uh, the, vo the votes will be there. Uh, if they're not here this year, they'll, they might be there next year simply because of, there's an election coming up. Um, and then beyond that, you know, you're going to have a new uh, president in the White House if it's, you know, let's just say, since we're guessing, President Clinton. You know, she's her budget's going to come up to the to the House and Senate with a big increase, probably, uh, for education, and then go from there. But uh, I mean, PAYGO, if they keep it in place, certainly it's going to be a, uh, a pain for anybody who's trying to increase programs on the entitlement side, on the mandatory side. Absolutely. But if you have 60 votes for the bill in the first place, you have 60 votes to waive PAYGO. So, right. <laughs> well, that's a question right now that, yeah, for a lot of other things other than education, yeah. Let me yeah, add to that is I think that it's, it's counterintuitive, but, but I believe that fiscal responsibility and deficit reduction actually can accompany some very sizable increases in programs that people care about. And the reconciliation bill is probably a pretty good example, though. That's, I think, the largest increase since the GI Bill in higher education funding, and it came out as a result of a of a deficit reduction vehicle. And so it sounds, I mean, it doesn't make sense, but it, or it doesn't sound like it makes sense at first glance, but I think at the end of the day, um, that has been the history anyway. The last six years have not seen major increases. There's been no PAYGO in, in place, or at least not a, um, this, it enforced in the same way. And yet there has been very, you know, constrained spending, I think, on both, um, in education anyway, both the mandatory and the discretionary side. So I actually see these as kind of working together. Okay, I guess we probably have time for another question. I think you wanted to, you wanted to ask one? Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, touched on this briefly, but uh, maybe you could go this, this a little more detail, the other panelists could. Um, if you were advising the leadership, what order would you advise they bring the approach they send the approach bills down to the White House, and where would labor rates fit into, into that? Uh, would you bring the one, for example, that passed the Congress by the widest margin so there'd be a, a real chance to keep override and get some momentum? Or you talk about pairing bills. Um, is there, are there other strategies that the leadership might look at? To, um, well, ag again, I think in the, you know, what you're, what you're looking for is the maximum leverage. You're looking for you know, making it a sort of a tough vote, I think, um, for the other side. And so I guess I would, you know, my own favorite candidate would be some kind of bill like the, the, the military VA bill has, a, you know, this, this historic increase for veterans programs, which, again, is I don't think there's a lot of disagreement anywhere really about that. And, and so, you know, that bill and perhaps with Labor H, um, there, there could be so many different choices. The Homeland Security bill is another bill that has a lot of support um, that I can imagine, you know, that kind of being a, a good combination of bills to send together. Again, I, I don't know whether that strategy, I doubt that the, the decision has been made on how to put these things together, but something that kind of um, draws attention to the very specific issues and programs that are at stake in this process, I think, is what people would be looking for. But, I mean, it, it does seem like, especially after the S-chip fight, potentially, you know, children's health care, and then now we got education, so it seems like that, that might be a good one to bring up next, just in terms of, you know, voting against programs for children. I'd say uh, Democrats think they have the winner in, uh, in S-chip. Uh, they think that that's, that's working for them, uh, even though it, it, they may not necessarily have the exact number of votes to override. Uh, the polls seem to, they, at least the Democrats are showing, the polls are working there for them on that. So if that's working, uh, I'm 
have or been reporting that they're going to they're going to send in the labor HHS bill next, which is the uh, understanding I've gotten is they think that's a winner for them uh, as well on the heels of the S chip bill. They know that President Bush is going to sign the military VA bill, um, so they don't they don't need him to sign a bill at this point. They need him to veto a bill at this point because everybody wins with the including Bush on the on the military VA bill. He's already said he won't veto that. Uh, sure. Go ahead. Uh, sure. I think we. Well, I, I was just thinking of, uh, about people's uh, thoughts about the next uh, time that we go forward with education funding and an initiative. It might be in a year or two years from now. And from what I hear and from what we're doing uh, right now, currently, and have been doing the last several years, uh, traditionally, uh, a coalition like the Committee for Education Funding is focused on discretionary appropriations. Yet, in the last several years, we've seen a movement toward hybrid vehicles for education funding, mandatory and discretionary, the uh, reconciliation bill. And uh, the, in, you know, the recommendation or the thought that to deal with uh, the current uh, fiscal scenario, combining, as you mentioned, Barbara, and others mentioned, deficit reduction with uh, budget increases as a political vehicle also is a potentially appealing. So to people on the Hill, anyway. Um, so I'm just asking uh, for your thoughts about, do you see that uh, in the offing, that we need to be thinking of some sort of more uh, global approach to the fiscal situation make that education increase happen. Please. <laughs> okay. um, so, we need so, so just to make sure I understand the question correctly. So you're saying, um, for example, the special education funding each year is caught up in, in the discretionary <laughs> spending fight. And is there is there something to be gained in moving that fight onto the mandatory side of spending. Is that that's an example, but that's already happened. Sure. That fights have been happening. Could happen again. I don't know if people want it to happen, but that's has been a scenario. And there's, but there's others. Mm -hmm. Like the Pell Grant hybrid now. Yeah, no, absolutely I mean there's been a lot of interest in kind of moving back and forth across the ledger um, of programs. I mean there you know the, some of the ch challenges the Appropriations Committee I think is yeah, um, you know, used to the jurisdiction that it has and is very comfortable with that. And um, so some of these things become, uh, you know, challenge sort of between the committees, I think that becomes a little bit harder to actually carry that out. But, but there's been a lot of conversations about sort of, I think, about how you can maximize your chances of kind of getting things through since the appropriations fight seems, seems to be so hard right now. And you've been, we've had seen some successes, I think, on the other side of things. In terms of a more global solution, you know, I do believe, and this is just, again, just me, <laughs> that um, that a, that the deficit reduction vehicles. You think about the balanced budget amendment, you know, agreement of 1997. That was where the chip bill, the S chip bill, at that point, was born. It was, so, some very significant kind of initiatives can occur as a result of these kind of grand negotiations and deals where deficit reduction is at the heart of it. And it, I, that's sort of my experience of how things happen. And I believe that can happen again. So I think it, you know, certainly behooves the education communi community to look more broadly um, rather than kind of, because it's a narrow fight. I think when, once you're in that fight of, about, you know, levels, you know, that's a very tough fight to, to win because at some point it's not just about levels. It's really a zero-sum game. My increase is somebody else's decrease, and that's, you need to, you know, grow the whole thing. <laughs> the whole pot needs to change. The whole way in which people approach this needs to change, or I think you're just fighting over the kind of scraps of it. And so, and I think that occurs actually through some of these bigger um, kind of approaches towards fiscal discipline. Okay. Well, I guess that we'll, we'll leave it at that. Thank you guys for coming, and uh, Helping us sort 